would like to thank Agnieszka and Jaroslav for the invitation and Agata for uh, making all of the arrangements. It's really quite an honor to be here today. Thank you for coming. I'm going to talk today about the relationship between two avant-garde groups active in the United States in the first three decades of the 20th century. Although the first is a group primarily of poets, and I should say I'll be speaking a bit more about them, and the second a group of painters and sculptors, their collective practices are mutually informative, particularly in the way they adapted to and partially resisted some of the modernist cultural practices that were dominant in the United States at the same time. There were also some key figures, most notably Marcel Duchamp and Man Ray, who were affiliated with both groups. Uh, this talk draws from my book, Collecting Its Modernist Practice. Please uh, forgive the shameless uh, self-advertisement, uh, which studied a variety of collective material forms, the interventionist literary anthology, the publicly displayed private art collection, and the archive all of which cooperated in the promotion of modernist art in the United States and competed over the form of its institutionalization. That contest and the heterogeneous forms it elicited largely ended with the emergence of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which opened in 1929 and acquired a permanent collection and building later in the 1930s. And in the literary field, a similar consolidation would occur as the interpretive style known as the new criticism dominated American universities beginning in the late 1930s. Establishing a set of protocols for reading poetry and a small canon of authors that could be classified as modernist. Before these apotheoses, however, the situation was much more fluid, which suggests that what is now called modernist art might have been configured differently, at least in the United States. There are, moreover, a number of factors particular to the American context that inform the practices of modernism's institutionalization. The first point to be made is that because the aesthetic avant-garde is a European invention, experimental modernism appeared later in the United States where it was articulated simultaneously as a problem of production, US-based avant-garde groups inspired by the foreign example, and a problem of reception. In this latter sense, modernism could be seen as something that was both figuratively imported in the sense that many artists emigrated to New York and elsewhere from European countries in the early 20th century, and also literally imported by rich and audacious American art collectors whose economic position was strengthened by the economic crash that afflicted Western Europe during and after the First World War. A second point worth observing is that in a general sense, U.S. institutions were themselves very much in the process of formation at the moment of the avant-garde's emergence in New York and elsewhere. By 1913, the year of New York's famous armory show, only a few cities in the United States could claim to have major civic museums. Between 1913 and 1929, the year MoMA was founded, virtually all the remaining American cities built major civic museums to house significant collections of European, mostly European, but also uh, American art. Detroit, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Minneapolis, Cleveland, Toledo, all opened their permanent buildings during these years, while the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. would not open until 1941. The emergence of avant-garde art therefore presented the possibility of inventing new forms of institutional practice through the very process of institutionalization. It was in this context that limited collective forms, such as the anthology and the private art collection and slightly later the archive, emerged as models for novel institutional arrangements. The larger argument of collecting as modernist practice claims that these collections can be understood as provisional institutions through which modernism was given the vocation of cultural reform. By contrast, as I will discuss today, the avant-garde groups that went by the name of Others and the Societe Anonyme employed these collective forms, but did so in a way that emphasized the value of sustaining dynamic collective avant-garde practices rather than the institutional aspirations I've just briefly described. The most important literary collection for the US uh, literary field of the 1910s was Des Imagistes, the first collection of literary imagism edited by Ezra Pound and published to little success in London in 1914, early in 1914, but which had a much greater impact in the United States when it appeared there later in the year. There, Des Imagistes claimed a space in the broader literary field for free verse, but it also established the semi-cooperative school or movement hitherto more strongly associated with French poetry 
as the dominant cultural logic governing the circulation of new poetry. Correspondingly, as the signal means of representing the literary school, the anthology genre emerged as the dominant material form for verse. Um, and I consider the anthology as, as a form of collection. The field of modernist anthologies that exploded in the United States in the decade following Des Imagistes subjected Pound's example to a complex set of identifications and disavowals. This was especially true for the two principal anthologists who followed in his wake. Uh, Amy Lowell, who made Imagism a financial success with three subsequent Imagist collections, and Alfred Kramborg, the impresario of the Others group. Lowell and Kramberg each wished to disavow the arbitrary authority of which Pound had been accused in composing and promoting Des Imagistes, but they never nevertheless each found in the Imagist anthology a new cultural strategy adaptable to their own collective free verse projects, one that succeeded in breaking from the older modes of legitima legitimation that Des Imagistes appeared to have superseded. Pound and Lowell, though they had engaged in a very public feud, had each traded on the idea of imagism as a school, a limited group of six to eight writers defined by a set of putatively shared aesthetic principles. By contrast, Alfred Kramborg's little magazine, anthologies, and affiliated projects, all of which bore the name Others, were defined by their association not with a single literary sensibility, but with a more generalized form of avant-garde practice. In this way, others had a more ambiguous, but also more authentic relationship to group identity, one best understood, I will suggest, with reference to the term formation. The child of working class German immigrants, Alfred Kramborg spent his youth and early adulthood in Manhattan. In 1913, he moved along with the painters Man Ray and Samuel Halpert across the Hudson River to an artist colony in the Palisades town of Ridgefield, New Jersey, also known as Grantwood. Ray and Halpert had each been affiliated with the Ferrer Center, a cultural center in Manhattan's East Village that had been part founded by the anarchist Emma Goldman. Grantwood would soon be populated by several Ferrer Center figures, including the anarchist artists Adolf Wolf and Manuel Komarov, the writer Floyd Dell, who would later edit the socialist paper The Masses, the poets Bob Brown and Oric Johns, and several others. It was at Grantwood in 1913 that Kramberg and Man Ray began publishing a little magazine called The Glebe. And it was here, in fact, that Ezra Pound uh, had sent the first manuscript for Des Imagistes, where it was published in a very limited run in advance of its book publication. The little magazine Others emerged after The Glebe collapsed. Others was conceived in collaboration with Walter Conrad Ehrensberg, a Harvard graduate of independent means who also financed the project. A poet himself, Ehrensberg is today better known for assembling with his wife Louise, one of the preeminent collections of modernist art in the post-armory show period. Um, and you can see he uh, owned one, uh, the version of New Descending a Staircase, which, uh, which had appeared at the Armory Show and which is uh, now in Philadelphia along with the rest of the Ehrensburg collection. By 1915, the Ehrensburg 67th Street apartment was home to a salon that was a central location for New York Dada. Two years later, the Society of Independent Artists, which I'll discuss later, would be organized in this apartment. Kramberg had, for his part, been introduced to modernism through his visits to the 291 Gallery in Greenwich Village, where Alfred Stieglitz's innovative, intimate installations had provided a model for uh, what Kramberg called the one-man shows that characterized the discrete issues of his first magazine, The Glebe. Ehrensberg, a devotee of Poundian imagism, was drawn to Kramberg for having been the original publisher for Des Imagistes. As Kramborg would recall a decade later, quote, Ehrensburg confided that what was needed in America was a poetry magazine, not like poetry magazine in Chicago. And I should say this may be a little bit confusing in, in, the, in the course of my talk, but there, there was a, a very important, still actually it's still in publication, a journal called Poetry. So I'll try to, when I'm talking about the journal rather than the, 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 the genre, I will, I'll, try to emphasize this. So Ehrensberg confided, confided that what was needed in America was a poetry magazine, not like poetry magazine in Chicago, which admitted too many compromises, but a paper dedicating its energies to experiment throughout. He wondered if such a venture was feasible and whether Kramberg would join him in it." End quote. 
According to Kramborg's account, they immediately decided on a few contributors, Wallace Stevens, Nina Loy, and themselves, as well as the journal's motto, the old expressions are with us always and there are always others. What Ehrensberg was specifically denouncing was what was widely known as Poetry Magazine's open door policy, which named its commitment to publishing poems written in traditional forms, as well as verse libre. Uh, or free verse. By avoiding this compromise, he and Kramberg aimed to situate the journal at the experimental vanguard of modernism. The editor of poetry, Harriet Monroe, made a, made a point of recognizing the distinction in a letter to Kramberg. Monroe wrote, poetry magazine, you know, tries to publish the best we can get of all the different schools. We have published a good deal of rather radical experiments and shall no doubt continue to do so, but I assume that others stands exclusively, exclusively for the radicals and for a rather more youthful effervescence that I'm quite ready to endorse publicly." <laughs> End quote. Uh, Monroe was being high-handed, but she was also informally agreeing to minimize competition within the expanding but still very limited modernist literary field. Thus, the position Kramberg and Ehrensberg crafted for others was important less for its participation in an argument about Harriet Monroe and Poetry Magazine than for what it implied more pointedly about the legacy of the imagist intervention as such. The example of others suggested that the importance of imagism to the United States had been misapprehended by most of the avatars of the free verse, even by Pound himself. Lowell's popularization of free verse in her imagist anthologies had wrested imagism from the realm of a laboriously acquired tradition and placed it within the grasp of a much wider audience of readers and practitioners. Kramborg, in contrast, cited imagism as an inspiration but discovered that its implications inevitably led away from both Lowell and Pound, as Kramborg would write a decade later. The movement which crystallized one and all which brought about a recognition of quasi-kinship was imagism. Imagism only gave us forms with which we were unfamiliar, stimulated us to try them. The individual response to our environment was still of necessity our own. Most of us welcomed imagism enthusiastically, but were puzzled by its foreign airs and graces. It was not enough. It depended too much on books we didn't know and too little on the life we knew. We accepted the forms, but could not accept the whole spirit. What was all this about the Greeks, the Provençal, the Chinese? And imagism includes um, both sort of replicas, but also translations from, from all of these uh, uh, older forms of poetry. It was beautiful, alluring, intoxicating, but it did not stay with us. It was too remote from our lives among the lonely streets and byways of this mysterious land. The untutored among us, and most of us were untutored, felt as if we had neglected our education. Some of us could not afford education, not college education. Others felt that college held the wrong education for them. We craved a more direct cultural expression, however crude, hard, and blundering. And uh, here's an example of probably the most celebrated others-ish uh, poem which appeared uh, in an earlier version of Others and then was published as a, as a standalone issue of Mina Loy's Songs to Joanna. So I'll just read the first stanza. Spawn of fantasies, silting the appraisable, pig cupid, his rosy snout rooting erotic garbage once upon a time. Pulls a weed, white and star-topped, among wild oats sown in mucous membrane. It's a great poem. Um, from Kramberg's perspective, imagism's importance consisted in its having been a modernist form that did not require its justification with reference to a cultural patrimony, available mainly through the privilege of an elite education. Ehrensberg, Mary Carolyn Davis, Horace Holly, Skipwith and Kathleen Cannell, and especially William Carlos Williams, who you can see holding a dog in the, in the front here. Um, but note that Duchamp and Man Ray are also among the, among the figures here. Although interestingly, uh, others had quite a few uh, uh, female poets, and um, they are not represented in this picture. Kramborg and Williams misremember the poets Mina Loy and Marianne Moore as participating as well in these, uh, in these weekly meetings. Although they would be, uh, later be among the most important contributors to others, they had not yet met Kramborg, but they would do a year later. 
Um, as the scholar Suzanne Ch Sir Churchill observes, the significance of the short-lived Grantwood colony is represented by its tendency to expand in duration and number in the memories of participants. In the pages of the New York Times, Peggy Johns, the wife of the poet Oric Johns, um, reported that the, that the weekly meetings were held to exchange talk of the latest star that has appeared on the Freeverse horizon or of the new rhythm one of their number may have invented since the last meeting and to plot the destruction of the traditional school of poetry. Um, after Kramberg and Ehrensberg instituted the little magazine Others, the Others formation appeared to extend outward, soliciting an informal membership from across the United States. This was true despite its very small print run of only around 300 copies per issue, sometimes less. As Williams recalled, quote, good verse was coming in from San Francisco, from Louisville, Kentucky, from Chicago, from 63rd Street, from Staten Island, from Boston, from Oklahoma City. Newcomers to the city, if they were alive to artistic interests in their own parts, naturally drifted into the crowd. Whereas other modernist literary anthologies of the 1910s and 20s were expressive of institutional ambitions and aimed to make interventions in the literary and social fields, Kramberg, by point of contrast, attempted to maintain for others a relationship to the loosely collaborative and more bohemian formation that had engendered it. Over the course of its run, others featured numerous special issues and guest editors, and these are just three of them. Uh, Helen Hoyt's uh, uh, Woman's Number, the Spectric School, which actually was a hoax, which I could discuss later, um, and it's a great story. And then uh, in December 1917, William Safir's A Number for the Mind's Eye, Not to be Read Aloud. Um, these may all be seen as indices of the desire to preserve the less hierarchical ethos <coughs> that many of its contributors associated with the project's origins at Grantwood. As Kramberg claimed in a late and rare intervention, the editors, quote, do not sit on judicial or pedantic pedestals. Primarily, they ask that they be permitted to evolve their own individualism, if they possess any, and to permit other folk to evolve theirs. They are editors in names only. If this may be read as privileging a desire for radical individualism, such individualism would evolve, to use Kramberg's word, in the context of the collective medium of others. It was an apparent contradiction that provided the project with its definitive structure. And I'll return to this point in a bit. The project advanced by Kramberg can be better understood through its relationship to another provisional institution, the Societe Anonyme which was founded by Catherine Dreyer together with Marcel Duchamp and Man Ray in 1920. The proximity of Kramberg and Dreyer, however, is more than conceptual as others and the Societe Anonyme were born from affiliated phases of the New York avant-garde and indeed had members in common. Duchamp and Man Ray, as we have seen, were important interlocutors and collaborators, collaborators with Kramberg and others at Grantwood. Dreyer, Duchamp, and Man Ray would all be on the board of directors of the Society of Independent Artists, whose first exhibition in 1917, organized at the Ehrensburg apartment, displayed twice as many works as had been seen at the Armory Show, organized its works alphabetically by artists, and insisted emphatically, as the, as the catalog says, um, uh, that it had no jury and awarded no prizes. Kramborg, along with fellow others Mina Loy and William Carlos Williams, would be among the 14 poets invited to give readings at the 1917 exhibition. Reciprocally, the journal and anthologies published under the title Others featured poetry written by painters and sculptors, Man Ray, Halpert, Wolf, Charles Demuth, William and Marguerite Zorak, Marston Hartley. Except for Wolf, all of these artists participated in the 1917 exhibition, as did Loy herself. This proxi proximity between poets and artists not only indicates the broader New York avant-garde scene that the groups helped determine, it also suggests the way that others and the Soci Societe Anonyme each operated as formations in Raymond Williams's sense of the term. In Williams's thinking, formations may be, quote, most recognizable as conscious movements and tendencies, literary, artistic, philosophical, or scientific, but they may also have attain a looser and not directly collaborative character as a mode of specialized intellectual or cultural practice. What I'm suggesting is that th this definition describes both the relationship among the others and societe anonyme groups, but also the internal logic of each discrete group as well. 
The First Society of Independent, Arti Independent Artists show is best known for its controversial rejection of Duchamp's first ready-made, the repurposed urinal titled Fountain. So if you, even though he helped organize the, uh, organize the exhibition, he also submitted this work under a pseudonym and it was rejected. Um, while it is believed that Catherine Dreyer played a role in rejecting the piece, this did not discourage Duchamp and Dreyer from future collaborations. This is a later picture of, uh, of Dreyer and Duchamp at her house in Connecticut, and you can see that she owned uh, the Duchamp work tomb, which is on top of the bookcase, and, and the famous uh, uh, Bride Strip Bear, uh, which is now in Philadelphia. And I should say that um, uh, it's, uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the Societe Anonyme collection in a bit, um, uh, but almost the entirety of the collection now resides at Yale, but, uh, but the Bride Strip Bear was, was donated to, to Philadelphia. Um, uh, it, uh, Duchamp was not uh, discouraged from collaborating with Dreyer, including most consequentially the founding, foundation of the Societe Anonyme three years later in 1920, an artist-run cooperative that would go on to stage more than 80 modernist exhibitions and produce 30 publications in the United States. These could range from small-scale exhibitions, sometimes playfully advertised, um, as with Marcel Duchamp's advertisement for the Alexander Archipenko exhibition in 1921, presented as an ad for the Archie Pen Company, to the large-scale international exhibition of modern art staged at the Brooklyn Museum in 1926, complete with furniture from a middle-class department store in Brooklyn, purchased in order to encourage the general public to continue to consider buying and displaying modernist art in their homes. Unlike the avowedly interventionist anthologies such as Pounds des Images or institutionalizing private collections like the Barnes Foundation in sur suburban Fidel Philadelphia or the Phillips Memorial Gallery in Washington, D.C., which were established in 1925 and 1923, respectively, the other's anthologies and Societe Anonyme collections emerged later as attempts to solidify or provide a record for more ephemeral semi-cooperative projects. These decisions may be understood as a general resistance to imagining the primary function of the formation as consisting in the production of a collection that could one day be enshrined in a major civic museum or as the quintessence of a literary school. In this way, both groups may be seen as deferring, if not refusing outright, the question that titles our conference this weekend, Museum of the Avant-Garde or the Avant-Garde or Avant-Garde Museum. Relatedly, each of these groups were also defined by a general commitment to the avant-garde as such. This entailed outwardly refusing a divisive partisanship within the avant-garde, while also rejecting the obligation to exhibit or justify work according to broader, more inclusive historical or aesthetic principles. Thus, just as the Societe Anonyme could claim in their first annual report, that they had exhibited post-impressionists, pre-cubists, cubists, expressionists, simultaneists, futurists, dadaists, and quote, those belonging to no schools, but imbued with the new spirit in art. The little magazine others would devote special issues to the schools and tendencies of the new poetry I've just mentioned. Even as a, even as a late manifestic policy statement from Kramberg would assert that collectively uh, or separately, we eschew everything which approximates ism, ism. And while others would devote itself to post-imagist experimentation, <coughs> The Societe Anonyme could claim in their first annual report that, quote, the works of men representing the older schools will not be exhibited as there are plenty of museums, exhibitions, and art galleries that handle works representing this period, end quote. A statement that strongly resembled the understated tendentiousness of others' motto, the old expressions are always with us and there are always others. It is telling that from within this context, Kramborg was rhetorically positioned as the reticent figurehead of a group that publicly performed a desire to have no figurehead. The poet Oric Johns remembered Kramborg as, quote, a modest, spe spectacled fellow who, in an undramatic, way, even neutral way, by some magic, won the heart of everybody. But then he went on to say that Kramborg also, quote, had the gift of leading up to the point where you said the thing he wanted said, end quote. 
This designedly ambiguous posture was adopted, too, in three others anthologies that Kramborg edited in the mid to late teens, which appeared without any preface, preface or other editorial apparatus and organized its contributors alphabetically. The lack of apparatus was nevertheless itself an apparatus entirely consistent with Kramborg's performance of his own editorial absence. While that absence aimed to accentuate the individualism of the other's contributors, it did so by emphasizing a group identity, one defined loosely by a set of shared practices rather than by a coherently defined aesthetic. Kramborg's claim was that the project was started, quote, with no sense of the word others as a group. This was um, simultaneously justified, but also a strategic overstatement of the radical autonomy of the collectively represented others. <coughs> Thus, the dust jacket of the first Others anthology, which appeared in July 1916, made a point of indicating its difference from Pound and Lowell's Imagist anthologies by proclaiming that approximately 50, although in reality 36, poets had contributed to the anthology far more than Lowell's six Imagists or the 16 poets in Pound's most recent anthology titled Catholic Anthology. At more than 150 pages, the book was also half again as long as those anthologies, in whose company it would often be reviewed. In this way, despite Kramborg's public suggestion that others existed for the sake of autonomizing its authors, the others' anthologies especially allowed the possibility <coughs> of consolidating the work of the journal as the product of a collective effort and showing others to be a project that issued from a larger and more organic collectivity than either phase of imagism could claim to have done. Indeed, despite his protestations against the collective nature of others, by the end of 1916, Greenberg was proposing a series of additional others projects, a bookshop, a book series, a series of pamphlets, a lecture bureau, the others players, even a Spanish language edition to be titled Otros. In a November 1916 letter to Williams, Greenberg argued, quote, my letters my letter from Bogey, Maxwell Bodenheim, argues that the name others must go on as a weapon. We might do things on the road, in Rutherford, or in town privately, to which end everything others does in the way of occasional publications would contribute, and eventually a complete combination of forces, others, Provincetown, musicians, etc., might be affected. Everything we have on record or in prospect as an independent body would strengthen our position, would give us votes in any collaborative effort. The anthology's unusual and at times entertaining critical reception does much to describe the ambiguity of Kramberg's stance within the increasingly heterogeneous field of American modernism. In the pages of Poetry Magazine, the other's anthology received a particularly perceptive review from Harriet Monroe's deputy, Alice Corbin Henderson, that keenly identified the irony of Kramberg's position. Henderson churlishly introduced her short review by announcing, um, replacing the outworn conventions of the I am Bic school, we have now the I am it school of poetry. Note, les I am its are not to be confused with les imagists, who are already outclassed and demodé. She then went on to quote from a series of poems, and this is not the whole review, but, the, but what's what's... <clears throat> What's not included are simply uh, quotations from poems. Um, she then went on to quote from a series of poems, all of which prominently featured the singular first-person po pronoun before concluding, we regret to say that the printer announces there are no more eyes in the font. In an immediate sense, the review openly refused <clears throat> to take the poem seriously, and in this way it resembled the general public reception of others as a fundamentally comical project. This attitude would also be evidenced in Clement Wood's appreciative but hardly canonizing article titled The Charlie Chaplins of Poetry. The art of Henderson's hilarious review, however, consisted in the way she allowed Kramberg's individualist apology to become an ironically unifying formal feature of the poems themselves. The poems used all the eyes in the font. The wish of others to establish itself beyond the parameters of a school was no less programmatic, Henderson implied, than had been either phase of imagism. At the same time, however, Henderson's review also pointedly failed to recognize others as the name for a form of social practice rather than a particular aesthetic. 
It is significant that when William Carlos Williams, outraged by Henderson's review, wrote to Harriet Monroe in defense of Cranborg, his letter did not defend the poems, but instead stressed precisely the significance of others as a formation. <clears throat> Valueless as the others, others anthology may or may not be, and remember he is uh, uh, included in, in the anthology, it is a fine thrust out into the dark. It has at least been a free-running sewer, and for ACH to ignore its positive qualities for the mere accident of its contents is too bad. Pound had already betrayed a similar failure of, of appreciation when he wrote anxiously to Monroe in 19, December 1915 that, quote, Kramberg gets too many new stars for them all to be real. These denigrations of Kramberg employed a standard of cultural valuation, permanent literary value, that was not the primary horizon of the other's project, the accident of its contents. And this insistence, indeed in agreement upon the badness of others, makes it all the more striking to observe that the other's anthologies contain far more poems that are regularly taught and anthologized today than do the Imagist anthologies. And they contain still more work by poets ready for rediscovery. Monroe made amends by commissioning an unusual second review of the other's anthology by Max Mitchelson, which appeared to acknowledge, although negatively, the qualitative difference of the other's concept. He noted that, quote, Miss Monroe's editorial ideal evidently is for poems of more artistic permanence than is exhibited by many in this volume. Before recognizing Kramborg in a decidedly more muted, even patronizing register than he had used a month earlier in his review of Pound's most recent anthology. Quote, when one tries to realize clearly all the drudgery, toil, and self-sacrifice involved in such a pioneer editing, one must extend to Mr. Kramborg hearty good wishes for, his, for success in his venture. Mitchelson's semi-conciliatory review also revealed the extent to which, for all his performed reticence, Kramborg was nevertheless widely understood to be the governing figure of others. This recognition could also take less patronizing forms. When Kramborg arrived in Chicago in 1916, Carl Sandburg, whose poems had already appeared in Others, presented him with a poem titled Others, written in the style he associated with the journal. Um, and this may, be, this may be an example of, uh, of um, uh, of a tactically bad poem. Uh, I, ivory domes, white wings beating in empty space, nothing doing, nuts, bugs, a regular absolute Humpty Dumpty business, positively falling off walls and no use to call doctor, lawyer, priest, no use boy, no use, oh pal of mine, oh Humpty Dumpty, shake hands with me, oh ivory domes, I am one of you, let me in, for God's sake, let me in. <laughs> I can read it again if you like. Um, what should be emphasized in Sandberg's poem is that Kramborg, as the honorific but also diminished Humpty Dumpty, the anthropomorphic egg of children's nursery rhymes, is synonymous with the collective you of others, over and against perhaps William Carlos Williams, who was a doctor, Wallace Stevens, who was a lawyer. Synonymous with the others collective, Humpty Dumpty is nevertheless also given the authority, almost literally, of a gatekeeper. I am one of you, let me in. Indeed, perhaps the most decisive point of comparison between Dreyer and Kramborg may consist in the remarkable loyalty expressed to them by the artists they represented. When Dreyer worked to consolidate the Societe Anonyme collection years after its peak activity, artists were eager to donate their work. John Storrs would write to Dreyer, quote, you can imagine how happy I am to be represented in such a collection, the collection avant la lettre of collections in America. Similarly, Robin Schulze has reported Marianne Moore's willingness to allow Kramborg to print her entire output of new poems for late 1916 and early 1917 in the 1917 Others Anthology. Writing into the New York Times in 1950, Dreyer could have been speaking for Kramborg as well as herself when she asserted, in response to a critical review of her recently published Societe Anonyme catalog, you have overlooked the point that it is the many who create a movement, not the isolated leaders. It is this we have emphasized which makes the collection of such historical value. The attitude against which Dreyer invade is one that has proven, if anything, more pernicious in the literary field. If Kramberg was himself a minor poet, Dreyer was a still more minor painter. But when the editor of Little Review, Margaret Anderson, 
told a colleague that she did not like Kramborg's verse, her friend replied, oh, but you would if you knew him. The value of Kramborg's and Dreyer's labor lay elsewhere in the more ephemeral practices of collecting and sustaining artistic formations. Thank you. <laughs>